Good evening. It's a real pleasure for me to be here. And tonight, I'm going to be addressing a big question. Is there a link between autism and the uniquely human capacity for invention? And I hope to show you that there is a link. But first, when did invention begin? Well, we know that at least two million years ago, some of our ancestors were creating simple stone tools like hammers and axes. Here is Homo habilis and Homo erectus, both lived around two million years ago. And they could use a rock to, uh, as a hammer to crack a nut uh, or a stone axe to cut and to scrape simple stone tools. And even Neanderthals, who lived about 40,000 years ago, were able to use these simple stone tools. But despite the small changes in the design of these tools, I argue that we see very little evidence of generative invention, the ability not just to invent once, but to invent uh, over and over again. And if we look at non-human animals who are living today, again, we see many animals can make simple stone tools. The chimpanzee, again, using a rock as a hammer to crack a nut. Uh, and here is a crow dropping a stone into water to raise the water level so that she can reach the worm. But I think these kinds of simple stone tools can be parsimoniously explained in terms of associative learning, where we form associations between two items, A and B. But that, I argue, will not give rise to generative invention, where we, where we invent unstoppably. But then, around 70 to 100,000 years ago, when Homo sapiens was on the scene, we suddenly see the rate of invention taking off. So this is the sign of generative invention. And I argue that what happened, what enabled this, is a cognitive revolution in the brain. So what was this cognitive revolution? It involved two new circuits in the brain, and the first of these is the systemizing mechanism. The systemizing mechanism is a circuit that allows us to look at the world around us and search for special patterns in the world. I call them if and then patterns. So if I take something and I do something to it, then I get a particular result. If and then. And the value of looking for these patterns is we not, when we find one, we can then repeat our observations, if and then, to confirm that the pattern holds true. But we can also experiment with each of these variables. We can change the if, or we can change the and, to produce a new then, a new result. And if we produce a new pattern, or observe a new pattern, then that is an invention. And I borrowed this terminology from the 19th century logician, George Boole, who analyzed the structure of human thought. Engineers use slightly different language. They talk about input, operation, output, but it maps onto the same logical sequence or logical patterns of if and then. And what you can see here is the feedback loop, which is very important. So we take something as the input, we perform an operation on it, and then we see what happens. That's the output. But the feedback loop allows us to repeat to see if we get the same result every time, or to change one of these variables to see if we produce a new pattern, an invention. So we know that the systemizing mechanism 
evolved at least 70 to 100,000 years ago because we can go back to the archaeological record and we see the first jewelry that modern Homo sapiens was making. And if we put ourselves into the mind of the inventor, one of our ancestors who made this jewelry, we can see the if and then logic. If I make a hole in each shell and thread a string through each hole, then the shells will form a necklace. So it's that if and then algorithm. And I'm going to give you a few examples from archaeology so that you can see the same algorithm at work. 71,000 years ago, we see Homo sapiens had invented another complex tool, the earliest bow and arrow. And again, look at the, the logic. If I attach an arrow to a stretchy fiber and release the tension in the fiber, then the arrow will fly. 40,000 years ago, archaeologists have found the earliest musical instrument, a flute made from a hollow bone of a bird. But once again, let's look at the, what was going on in the mind of the inventor, that if I blow down this hollow bone and cover one hole, then I make a particular sound. But if I blow down the hollow bone and cover two holes, then I make a different sound. So our ancestor, the inventor of this complex tool, had not only invented a new system, a musical instrument, but had also invent invented a system of sounds that we call music. 40,000 years ago, we see the, the earliest cave paintings. 25,000 years ago, we see some of the earliest sculpture, in this case, um, made from ivory. 23,000 years ago, we see the earliest sewing needles, again made from bone. So our species, Homo sapiens, doesn't just invent once, we invent non-stop, and we're still at it today. 12,000 years ago, we saw the invention of agriculture, which transformed our health, our lifestyle, and our diet, but here, let's look at the algorithm at work, the patterns, if I take a tomato seed and plant it in moist soil, then I get a tomato plant. And 5,000 years ago, we see the domestication of animals so that we are using animals as a tool to do work for us. So here, the algorithm, if I have a heavy stone, and I harness it to my ox, then the heavy stone will move. So suddenly we're capable of building constructions that no other species has been able to. And it's thought that this was how Stonehenge was built. And let's look at some modern examples. If we think about in the invention of public health, and particularly the invention of the lockdown as a public health measure, we see the same algorithm at work today. If the infection rate is doubling every week and we don't do lockdown, then 50,000 people will die this winter. So scientists uh, are still using that algorithm today. And if we think about the invention of the vaccine in 2021, if I take the genes for COVID spike protein and put them into a harmless virus, then I have a vaccine against COVID. Unstoppable generative invention. So that's the systemizing mechanism that evolved 70 to 100,000 years ago. But I want to tell you about the other important circuit in the brain that was part of the cognitive revolution. Because the systemizing mechanism can tell us how we invent, but can't always tell us why we invent. Let's go back to the earliest jewelry. The systemizing mechanism can tell us how we made it, the technology behind it, but the empathy circuit, a new circuit in the brain at that time, tells us why we invented it. Perhaps we were making jewelry so that other people might think that we were beautiful. 
or of high social status. So it's a clue that the maker of the necklace could imagine the thoughts and feelings of another person, of the observer. Or perhaps the maker was creating the necklace as a gift, again thinking that the other person might enjoy the gift and it would make them happy. So this artifact in the archaeological record is a clue that our ancestors by this point had empathy. And if we think back to the bow and arrow from 71,000 years ago, it's not just a piece of technology, but it's also a stealth weapon that we could use it so that the prey would have no idea what was about to hit them. We could imagine the thoughts, the knowledge of the prey. So the bow and arrow represents, or, or is another clue, that the empathy circuit had evolved. And even that musical instrument, the flute, it's not just about how did we make it, but why did we make it. When we play music, often we're thinking about the audience and what kinds of emotions will be triggered in the audience when they hear music, that music is a form of communication. The empathy circuit allowed the evolution of complex social skills such as deception and referential communication. Modern neuroscience, particularly using functional MRI, tells us that empathy isn't just in one place in the brain. Actually, it's distributed across many different regions of the brain, at least 10, so that we can talk about an empathy circuit a network of brain regions that are activated when we think about other people's thoughts and feelings. And the systemizing mechanism seems to include the intraparietal sulcus among other regions. Let's get back to our big question. Is there a link between autism and invention? Well, anecdotally, Many inventors seem to have a lot of autistic traits. This is Thomas Edison, famously the inventor of the first electric light bulb, but he invented non-stop. He had many, many inventions. As a teenager, he was obsessed with Morse code, which is a system of patterns, um, and he named his two children Dot and Dash, and his wife, when he got married, moved his mattress into his workshop so that he could be inventing day and night. Here we have Isaac Newton and Albert Einstein, both remarkable physicists, people who understood the systems like gravity and relativity, but their biographers report that they had a lot of autistic traits. Isaac Newton was often in conflict with many people, and he continued to give his lectures for many years, even after students stopped coming because they were too complex, because it was in his job description. <laughs> Einstein famously didn't speak until he was five years old, so had a significant language delay, and preferred solitary activities. And moving away from science, to music, this is Glenn Gould, the classical pianist. Again, people describe him as having many autistic traits. He wanted to use the same chair in every concert that had to be at exactly the same height and distance from the piano. And after every concert, he went to the same diner at exactly the same time and ordered the same meal sitting at the same table. So he loved repetition and structure and predictability. What about the reverse? Is there signs, are there signs that autistic people are gifted at pattern recognition? Well, this is Derek Paravicini. He's autistic. He ha also has learning disabilities, and he's congenitally blind. Despite his disabilities, if he hears a jazz song just once, he can repeat it and perform it perfectly and even transpose it into a new key instantly. And this is Daniel Tammet, who some of you will have heard of. He's also autistic and he has synesthesia. 
And his interest is in, is in numerical patterns. He is the European champion for memorizing the number pi that you can see in the background. He memorized it to 22,400 decimal places. So whereas Derek, who we just met, was fascinated by auditory patterns, Daniel is fascinated by numerical patterns. And this is Max Park, also autistic, but despite his social and communication difficulties, he is the number one world champion in the Rubik Cube, and he's fascinated by visual patterns. But these are just anecdotes, and anecdotes don't amount to evidence. So we went out to collect evidence to test whether there was a link between autism and invention. We, we tested a large population, 600,000 people, using a measure called the Autism Spectrum Quotient, or the AQ. And what you can see here is that men in the population, on average, have slightly more autistic traits than women. And of course, autistic people have even higher scores in terms of autistic traits. But relevant to the link between autistic traits and systems thinking, we found that people who work in STEM, science, technology, engineering, or mathematics, have more autistic traits on average than people who do not work in STEM. So evidence for a link between aptitude in understanding systems and the number of autistic traits that you have. We also asked that large population to fill in a questionnaire about their empathy, how easily they can understand another person's thoughts and feelings. What you can see here is in that large population of 600,000 people, on average, women scored higher than men at empathy. And when they completed a systemizing measure, how interested are you in a variety of systems whether natural or man-made, what we found was men, on average, scored higher than women on this, test, on this measure of interest in systems and how things work. And what we found was that autistic people scored lower, on average, than typical individuals when it came to empathy, but they scored higher, on average, than typical people when it came to a fascination and an aptitude with systems. So once again, we're finding a link between autism and a talent in understanding systems. We then looked at both of these questionnaires, empathy and systemizing, and found that we could classify the whole population into five different brain types or different profiles. Some people lean more towards empathy, we call them type E, and some people lean more towards systemizing, we call them type S. And then there are people who are an extreme of type S, who systemize non-stop, but they struggle to imagine other people's thoughts and feelings. And what we found in that large population was that more women, shown in yellow in that right-hand plot, more women had a, a brain of type E. More men, shown in green, had a brain of type S. And autistic people, shown here in purple and red, were more likely to have a brain of type S or extreme type S. So once again, a link between autism and aptitude in systems or seeing these if-and-then patterns. And this just shows you, numerically, that more women had a type E brain, more men had a type S brain, and the majority of autistic people had a systemizing or extreme systemizing brain. So this leads to a prediction, because autism is genetic, partly genetic, and if the link between autism and aptitude in systemizing is itself genetic, then we should find 
more cases of autism in places like Silicon Valley, which attract people who are good at systems thinking. Well, Silicon Valley is a long way away. We went to the Silicon Valley of the Netherlands, which is Eindhoven. Eindhoven is a city of interest because it has the Institute of Technology there, and it's also had the, the Philips factory there for over 100 years, attracting people who are good at engineering and IT. And we looked at the rates of autism in Eindhoven compared to two other Dutch cities, Utrecht and Haarlem, which were matched for various demographics, and found that the, the rate of autism was more than twice as high in Eindhoven compared to those two other Dutch cities. So again, evidence of a link between autism in the children and aptitude for systems thinking in the parents. And just to confirm if that link was a genetic link, we carried out a molecular genetic study by collaborating with the company 23andMe. Some of you will have heard of them. It's a personal genomics company. And what we found was there was a significant overlap between the common genetic variants that are associated with how well you score in systemizing and the common genetic variants that are associated with autism. So even in our DNA, we find a link between aptitude in systems thinking and autism. So we've seen, I think, lots of clues and evidence for links that autistic people and their genes have driven human progress. And yet, how is society treating autistic people? The majority of autistic people are unemployed as adults and struggle with poor mental health, depression and anxiety, which is likely to be an, a, a, the result of not getting the right support uh, and being excluded from society. I think we have a moral responsibility, a moral duty to ensure that no group is left out of society and in particular autistic people enjoy, should enjoy the same human rights, the right to employment, the right to education, the right to participation in society as, any, as anyone else. So I think it's time for a change in our society. We can learn a lot from companies like Orticon that are operating now right across Europe and in the US who only hire autistic people, particularly those who have an aptitude for coding. And they are teaching us that autistic people can work, can be included in the world of employment, and that we can make reasonable adjustments to the workplace to ensure that we support autistic people with their disability. And I'm pleased that many companies are now following the example of Orticon in welcoming autistic people into work. It's time really to embrace neurodiversity, the idea that brains come in many different varieties. And neurodiversity really means that brains are different, but one is not better or worse than another. They're simply different. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Simon, for an amazing talk. We have uh, around five minutes for some uh, questions from the audience. And we can start with, are there genetic markers screening autism today? Are genetic markers used? Are there any genetic markers screening autism yeah. today? So this is a really important question, because although autism is partly genetic, as I mentioned, do we want to use genetic information for screening? My own view is that this would be a dangerous thing to do, because once we start using the science of genetics to screen for autism, this could lead to eugenics, 
And we saw the horrific consequences of eugenics during the Holocaust, during the Second World War, when eugenics thinking was used to eradicate people with learning disabilities amongst other groups. So even if it was scientifically possible to use genetic markers for screening, I don't think it would be ethical. But actually, even scientifically, it's not yet possible. Um, question two would be, how, how early on life can you detect autism? How early can you detect it? Yeah. yeah. So this is very important because some of my presentation focused on adults who are autistic, but actually autism can be detected in infancy. Our own research showed that you can identify autistic children as young as 18 months of age using a simple checklist or questionnaire that the family physician or health visitor can use. So it can be detected early, and I would argue that screening after birth, but not prenatally, is ethical, because if we can identify children who need support, we can start intervention early, at the earliest possible stage, so that autistic children, even before they start school, can be benefiting from extra, extra help. How can you tell whether an autistic person has more, quote-unquote, strengths than weaknesses? Yeah, so we all have strengths and weaknesses. Part of my presentation today was to almost change our perception of autism, because for many decades, we have only focused on the difficulties, the challenges that they have. Whether we're talking about clinicians or researchers, or even as a society, we focused on the things that they struggle with rather than looking at their strengths. So what I hope is, as a result of this discussion, we'll see autistic people not just having a disability, but also simply being different, that as a result of their genes, the wiring of their brains, from the earliest point, they're processing information differently, and that this leads to a profile of not just disability, but also strengths. And every autistic person should be assessed for their strengths. It's a new way of looking, because when you look, you'll find them in every autistic person. Um, I believe we have maybe more time for a couple more questions. And that would be, is ADHD an autism-related? Hmm. So ADHD, attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder, it's a separate condition, uh, but many autistic people have both. They have autism plus ADHD and vice versa. So this could be for partly overlapping genetic reasons, but also it's just a fact of reality that when you meet an autistic person, typically they don't just have autism, but they have autism plus other things. They might have learning disabilities, ADHD, dyslexia, a whole range of different things. And psychiatry and clinical psychology often looks at putting a person into a single category, one at a time, but actually the reality is that many people have multiple diagnoses. Yeah. How old is autism? As in, when did it first appear? Hmm. So, if we're talking about the first description of autism, it goes back to the 1940s with uh, the child psychiatrist Leo Kanner uh, working in John Hopkins University. Some people have argued that the pediatrician Hans Asperger working in Vienna was also reporting a very similar condition, um, overlapping with autism even in the late 1930s. But as you can tell from my talk, I think these were just the scientists documenting it. I think there have always been autistic people, as long as there have been homo sapiens, human beings, and that the genes for autistic traits are in all of us. It's just a matter of degree. 
They lie on a bell curve, with most of us just having an average number of autistic traits, but as you saw, some people having an above average number of autistic traits. And in the modern society, the view is that people only need a diagnosis if they have a high number of autistic traits which are causing them to struggle or causing them distress. Then they'll go to a clinic, receive a formal diagnosis, but actually if you have a high number of autistic traits and you're managing fine, then you don't really need the label of autism. I'm afraid that's all the time we have today actually for questions, but if you have any more questions, please invite Professor Simon for a drink downstairs, first floor, and he will answer away. And we will be seeing you again on the 15th of March with the history of everything. Please give it away for Professor Simon for an amazing talk. And thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.